Welcome into the Thunder Basketball Universe. Today's episode, we're talking about Lou Dort, the man responsible for the torture chamber. <laughs> and uh, it was on full display in the Thunder's postseason <laughs> this year, whether it was guarding Luka Doncic, whether it was guarding Brandon Ingram. Also had some time on Kyrie Irving. I mean, I think the world started to really get an understanding of the menacing defense that comes from Lou Dort. Yeah, and you know, It's great that everybody got to see this in a playoff context yet again, and maybe more of a national perspective on Lou. Uh, We saw that he was the the first guy off of the all defensive team list. So came in as the, I guess, 11th best defender, according to uh, the media that votes on this award, just barely missing all defensive second team. But as we've talked about many times in regards to a lot of different players, those awards don't validate no. uh, a player one way or the other. Um, but I think I think that those votes might look differently next year, given what Lou Dort put on uh, on the floor this past season. I love what Chet Holmgren said. He said, I don't know what else he has to do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else he needs to do. This man is out there fighting for his life defensively every single night, yeah. doing and, a great job. And more importantly, making the other guys on the on the team that he's defending fight, fight for, for their, their lives, lives yeah. as well. Yeah. Definitely. And we saw so much from Lou throughout this entire season. So we've got a stat. We've got something that made us look. We've got a quote. And we've got something that blessed our timeline from Lou this season. So yeah. Nick, kick us off. What is your stat of the season for Lou Dort? I've got two, but I think they kind of tell a similar story. It's 99% okay. and 61%. 99%. I, I don't know. What okay, would that be? So the 99% is the percentage of lose three pointers this year that were assisted. Oh, wow. And okay. so if you look over the course That's of his a good career, uh, a lower and lower percentage of his three pointers have been unassisted. So yeah. beginning of his career, he was taking more threes off the dribble. Now he's really refined his role in his game to be a catch and shoot guy. And that's why we've continued to see his three point percentage elevate up above, you know, 40% this year. Yeah. The other stat I wanted to throw in there was 61%. And that's what Lou shot inside of three feet this year. Very cool percentage last season. Lou Dort shot 52% inside of three feet. So to make that big of a jump, nine percentage points Mm -hmm. uh, elevated the story that I wanted to tell with those two stats is efficiency on the offensive end. Well, this is a massive yep. storyline for Lou this season because I remember coming into this year, training camp, all of that stuff. It's like, Lou, what'd you work on? Lou, what was your focus? And he was like, really just honing in on the good shots I needed yeah. to take. And I remember a very specific quote. It was during a scrum, I believe, at practice. And we were talking about how Lou, you know, kind of slimmed down his shot diet. How did you become more efficient? And he said, I watched a lot of film and I put up some crazy shots. <laughs> I remember him saying that yeah. specifically. And for him to have that self-awareness and put in the work right. to watch the film, to practice the shots that he needs to take, and then for it to actually play out in real time, all of that decision-making to be able to shoot 61% from right there around the rim. Yeah. Massive, massive improvement for Lou. It's essential for this team moving forward that Lou be that level of an efficient player because yeah. um, in terms of the the sheer volume of attempts that he's going to get, uh, they're not going to be that many, but they're going to be very impactful. And yeah. as we see in the playoffs, um, teams are going to try to take those shots away from uh, Shea, Chet Holmgren, Lou Dor, I mean, excuse me, Chet, uh, Jalen Williams. And Lou got more of those shot attempts in the postseason. I think this is a great uh, opportunity for this team to learn like what types of shots are probably going to be available to these guys. Yeah. Because while those three players that I mentioned have more of a scoring burden just because of the way that the Thunder's offense flows, the Thunder's offense does flow. It has a rhythm to it that allows other guys to just get the shots. And if they're open, they have to take them. Yeah. And so for Lou having a tighter game Mm -hmm. and a better understanding of what shots are his shots is really essential. If you watch Lou in a offensive possession without the ball, I mean like the, the he's gotten really good at finding those windows, finding those creases, the spaces, knowing where his spots are on the floor. You see him knock down those corner threes. Like that's, that is an awesome place for Lou. That's has been his bread and butter really since he got to the thunder. And then you see him cutting without the ball too. He's gotten really good at that getting right there around the, the, the lane and around the rim for those easy kind of you know back cut actions that sure. teammates find him on so that was really really good stats nice. there from you nick gallows like like, <laughs> like good deep dive stat from you all right mine 56 and 11 
56 and 11. Probably. You're gonna have to tell me, I have no idea. 56 is the number of offensive fouls drawn by Lou Dort. Wow. During okay. the regular nice. season. All right. So here's here's we have to we have to qualify these. Offensive fouls are not charges. Correct. Okay. Isaiah Joe. They can be. They can be. Yes. They fall under the same kind of umbrella of an offensive foul. An offensive foul is like a rectangle. Correct. And a charge is like a square. Look at you. That there was we go. Okay. education. Yeah. Um, so Isaiah Joe and Jalen Williams, Jay Will, were the leaders on the Thunder roster in charges. Correct. Yes. Drawn. That's the one where you're like standing at the rim and the guy runs you over trying to shoot a layup yeah. or a dunk. Lou Dort's offensive fouls are people trying to screen him yeah. and failing. <laughs> Badly. Word to the wise, yeah. don't screen Lou Dort. Just don't. <laughs> it's not going to work. And it'll, yeah. I'll get into this a little bit later, but it's it's not because Lou is like out here bowling people over. Right. It's not because like he's selling it. The man is just really hard to screen. Very crafty. He is quick yeah. on his feet. And Coach Dagnall points this out a lot. He has this very unique blend of size and strength, but quickness and Agility. Mm -hmm. You don't get that off. Yeah, the feet. The feet. Yeah. The feet. I'll get into this a little bit later. But he is always moving his feet. They're hardly ever still. And he does a really good job of making sure his chest is in front of the player yep. that he's guarding. No matter what sort of obstacle is coming yeah. his way, <laughs> <laughs> most likely a screen. Lou is kind of like this heat seeking missile that's like, I I gotta get there. I gotta get to that <laughs> spot right there. Yes. And I'm gonna get there. And I don't know exactly what I got to do to get there, but I'm going to weave around however mm -hmm. I need to weave around. He mixes up his overs and unders in terms yeah. of uh, how he gets around the screen. A lot of times he does this very boldly where he'll like go underneath the screen that's being set for yeah. a shooter like Steph Curry or Damian Lillard or something like that just to freeze that guy and throw him off a little bit. A lot of times, you know, those screeners will set those screens up really, really high yeah. to try to force a guy to go under. Um, but when Lou does it, he's so quick, he's able to Super get around quick. it in time uh, to be actually still be able to be there in position. And the 11 is the number of offensive fouls that Lou drew during the 10 playoff games yeah. that the Thunder That's pretty played. amazing to have more 11. than one. Yeah, more than one a game is really impressive. Probably 100 times a game, Lou is getting screened. If you yes. just think about, you know, he's on the floor for 36 minutes and, you know, there's probably 80, you know, 80 possessions for the other team at least once a possession he's going to get screened and yeah. the screen is not coming from like a case and wallace character or an yeah. isaiah joe <laughs> it's coming from a guy that probably more fits the mold of a jay will right seven foot six ten yeah. 250 pounds that's your typical screener in the NBA exactly. if you're looking at a center position type of player. Yeah, and I yeah. think of Lou Dort's first season, right? So mm -hmm. this was with, you know, Chris Paul. This was with Dennis Schroeder and Steven Adams. Yeah. So during practice, Lou was getting screened by Steven Adams right. yeah. relentlessly. Yeah. And I have to imagine that helped him understand what goes into navigating an NBA screen early on in his career. Yeah, and there's a lot of things in that first year that he picked up, you know, mm -hmm. from defending Dennis Schroeder full court, being defended by by him and <laughs> yeah. Chris Paul in, in that first year. And, um, uh, you know, not to mention a guy like Shea, who obviously has of shown course. his defensive chops over the course of time as well. So, yeah, great stuff. Great, great stat there, Paris. I had to bring that one yep. up. All right, let's get into what made us look from Lou this, uh, this season. And I picked... He shot 52% from three in the first round. And we talked about, obviously, Lou's great decision-making in terms of his shooting. But his 53% in round one was just so perfectly timed. Yeah. And knowing how much work he put into his shot throughout the season and through the offseason, for it to pay off in yeah. his, his first playoff game back since his rookie year, oh my gosh, that was just so cool to see. And I, I think a great window into the fact that the Thunder, in as they you know hopefully continue to get into more of these playoff environments, they're going to be defended differently by yeah. these different teams. And the way that New Orleans defended the Thunder was really trying to limit Shea Gildas Alexander's effectiveness as a scorer and right. a playmaker that allowed for cleaner looks from behind the arc for Lou Dort in that series. The way that Dallas defended the Thunder was, you know, switching everything. And that led to a very different type of look. The fact that Lou was able to capitalize in that New Orleans series is a great boost to, you know, the Thunder recognizing, okay, if we get defended like this, mm -hmm. we 
you know, feel very confident about the solutions that we have for that over the course of a series yeah. and, um, you know, continued opportunities for the Thunder to learn from all of these different ways that they're being guarded. And just stepping into those shots with confidence, yeah. knocking them down and just rising to the moment. It was, it, I had a little bit of flashbacks to his first playoff series ever yeah. as a newly minted Thunder player, the former two-way guy in the bubble knocking down threes left and right against the Houston Rockets. And then you see where he is today, guarding, still guarding yeah. the, the best player out there on the floor, knocking down threes, just great stuff from Lou Dort offensively in, in the playoffs. Okay. What made you look same series. And okay. it was his de- defense on Brandon Ingram oh, in that first the round other end of the floor. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that I think really opened a lot of national people's eyes yeah. to what we've been seeing all along with Lou and that, he can just uh, put these guys in, in the Dortcher chamber, as they say, and just really um, make some of these elite scorers look like they have a very difficult time playing the game of basketball. And Brandon Ingram is an amazing player. And so none totally. of this is a knock on like how you know Brandon Ingram played or you know he's obviously still kind of returning from an injury too. But the way that Lou was able to really yeah. get up underneath Ingram, um, force him away from some of the spots on the floor that he really liked, prevent him from beating him off the dribble. I mean, Lou and his ability to move his feet, be physical with his chest and his legs as opposed to with his hands um, is really impressive and we saw that on full display is really Ingram did not have much of an opportunity to get going at all in that series. To add a little extra context to this, Brandon Ingram much taller than Lou yeah. Dort, very different, you know, physical composition than Lou Dort. And so it was kind of a different cover. And for Lou, his bread and butter you know, defensively are the guys that are just on the ball the whole time, yeah. you know, like the, the ones that are out there dribbling the ball, dribble, dribble, like all the time. That's, that's where Lou really thrives. And so it was interesting to see him go up against kind of more of a finesse player, yeah. a taller guy um, who can shoot over him if he right. wants to right. and Lou's ability to just take up his airspace not allow any kind of room to operate was really impressive to watch throughout that series. And he forced Ingram into 35% shooting for the series, mm. 25% from three point range and, you know, only 14 points in 36 minutes a game. I mean, that is yeah. really elite defense. I love what coach Dagnall says about Lou. It's like, if having a go-to offensive knockdown shooter player is the most valuable thing in the NBA, then you have to have a guy who can neutralize them. Those are really the yeah, super like, valuable yeah, if players. Right. If, yeah, that has to be the other end of that value spectrum. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Lou Dort just rising to that challenge each and every night. And a foul. Let's get into you can Shay that again. What's your quote? And I guess it's a good thing, you know, because they want to see me out the game. But, uh, um, you know, I don't really pay attention to that. You know, I'm, I'm still trying to play my game, stay aggressive. And, um, you know, if, if if the fans are happy when I get a call foul, it's just all right. It's whatever. Lou is talking about, oh, and I felt like great. this is so innocent and so sweet. Like, he's talking about how when they were on the road in the playoffs yeah. and he would pick up a foul, um, you know, the other team's fans would cheer. But there's kind of a two-tiered level of cheering that you get from opposing team's fans. One is, like, they're just cheering because a foul was called on the other team. Right. Then there's like sort of a secondary level of cheering when they realize who the foul is being called on and how many fouls that player has. Right. And, hmm. you know, the the announcer, the PA announcer inside of uh, American Airlines Center or Smoothie King Center could have said, you know, Lou Dort with his second foul. And both of those crowds would be like going crazy that it was Lou's second foul because, you know, they just they're desperate to get him off the floor. Yeah. This kind of echoes um, something that Mark Dagnalt said that he sees in opposing players who when they get sent to the scorer's table and Mark then will send Lou to the scorer's table immediately as well. The look that those players give to to Mark of like, come on, man, are you kidding me? Like give me one minute out there on the floor without this guy, uh, you know, up and down the floor next to me. Uh, I I thought that was like kind of a a nice um, little moment for Lou to sort of recognize the impact that he's having. The question was posed to him a little bit of like, 
what's it like being a villain for like yeah. opposing teams yeah. fan bases and he was like well i hope i'm i don't want to be a villain i know <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> he's just like very innocent about it but he was like I, my goal is just to make it tough and yeah. like if it's tough then i guess it's good that they want me off the floor <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at the end of the day it's but a, it really yeah, it's it, a good sign yeah. it comes down to the timing of the cheers because if they start cheering right after the whistle you know they're just cheering for their right their player right if they start cheering after the announcer yeah. says who the foul is on, you know. Then you know it's... Yeah, yeah. no. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, that was Lou's introduction into... And this is the first time Lou is playing in the playoffs in front of a, crowd. a crowd. Yeah. yeah. So yep. this was all brand new to Lou as yep. well. Um, a really cool moment for <laughs> Lou. That was hilarious. My uh, Shay That Again made me laugh as well. I'm actually fast. Like the sprints and stuff, you know, when I get to <laughs> compete against all my friends, I, I beat them all the time. But... uh you know, I usually do it. I I do a couple laps, and then we do some sprints sometimes. But like the hundred and the two hundred, I'm like I'm hard to beat. Can you just imagine that Lou's like at home in Montreal, just like sprinting, sprinting down the street, just having a foot race? So this is actually that's like something I used to do with my buddies I when I was like 19. I could see that. <laughs> For no reason. I bet I could beat you in a race. (laughs) You want to race? Literally for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But Lou, same sort of competitive energy. Same vibes. Like, honestly, same energy. Um, During the off season, he told us, like, look, I'll do whatever. Like, I'll whatever helps keep me in shape, whatever is going to help my game. He loves running track. Like he said, I that's my thing. That's he tried jujitsu, boxing, all these other sort of things. Tennis, I think he got into a little bit. Um, But he's like definitely like on the track that's my bread and butter and i'm actually fast (laughs) wanted to make sure we knew like you're and i was like well yeah (laughs) i could have told you that the way you're like able to quickly jog around the screens and get back in front of your player like you don't defend luka Doncic or steph curry (laughs) or you know damian lillard without being fast yeah i could have told you that let's get into bless your timeline um, I'll go first here. Okay. Every single season when Lou Dort's name is announced in the starting lineups, it's weird. It sounds like boo, but they're all yelling Lou. They're all yelling Lou. It is the most wholesome things. They go from cheering for Shay, cheering for Chet, and then Lou is just like so loud. Um, and so I, I knew that happened, but then when we got to the playoffs, and those fans were hyped up. Yeah. They were amped up. They had their super cape t-shirts on. <laughs> they were feeling like superheroes out there. That Lou rang out so loud. And it was it was just on another level. And I could not help but smile. And I know that Lou could kind of feel that in his bones yeah. a little bit. It was right there up there with the barking for me. Right. You know, when J-Dub's name was announced during the starting lineups. But when the whole crowd is in on that same little inside, you know, moment of Lou, yeah. when his name is called, oh, it brought such a smile to my face. It it just goes to show yet again the connection that these guys have built with the fan base. The continuity factor is so important for these NBA teams and for the cities and for the yeah. players. And you just you feel it brimming off of these guys that there's a relationship that's been built now. Totally. And it's not a coincidence. I mean, Sam Presti said this years ago mm-hmm. that the guys that were on that, you know, 1920, the, uh, sorry, 2021, mm-hmm. 21, 22, 22, 23, like that those guys were going to be competing to be a part of the next great yeah. set of Thunder teams. Yeah. And part of competing uh, to be a part of those teams is, you know, being the type of player, being the type of teammate, being the type of um, steward in the community that impacts this whole organization and impacts uh, the fan base as well. Lou Dort, clearly one of those guys. And also it makes me happy that our fans appreciate Lou yeah. for all that Lou brings to the table. Like some fans will only cheer when either, you know, a big dunk happens or a big, you know, block, steal, dunk, like all of those. You're talking about in other markets, right? uh, In yeah, other yeah, markets, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Other, yeah. other fan bases in other markets. And our fans will cheer when Lou like dives on the floor yeah. for a loose ball or picks up one of those offensive fouls or just makes an awesome hustle yeah. Lou Dort play. Yeah. And I'm like, yes, thank you for appreciating that. <laughs> we didn't have to ask you to do that. We didn't right. have to show you. You just know like that's winning. That is winning energy. Okay, we'll bless your timeline from Lou this season. It, it was it was Lou Day. It was Dort Day in Montreal. Oh, in Montreal! Yeah, I got to take yeah. you all the way back to the beginning of the season when the Thunder went up north of the border to Montreal to Lou Dort's hometown. You know, the team gets to go to Toronto, which is just, you know, 
a few minutes away from Shea's hometown mm -hmm. every year for their game against the Raptors. The organization uh, was able to, to get a preseason game up there with the Detroit Pistons in uh, in October, and that was such an amazing celebration of Lou. Yeah. We saw some cheekiness from Lou Dort in the opening minutes of that game when he decided, you know what, okay, my teammates are feeding me. They're gonna yeah. let me like take a few extra shots here in the first few possessions, um, and so we, we it was the full Lou Dort experience up there. It was so special to him to be able to share his city and you know his culture up there in Montreal with the rest of his teammates and yeah. just to be able to experience that I think both his teammates the organization and Lou just really really appreciated yeah, it he doesn't always get to be the center of attention nor does he want to be no <laughs> but when the time is right and he can be I think he really uh, embraces that and yeah like cherishes it I so, think so too yeah. that was so special I remember that trip oh yeah. so much fun and the entire Thunder organization too went up to Montreal, had a bunch of activations yeah. all. I mean, it, it was really thundered out up there in yeah. Montreal. So Lou Dort and a Thunder takeover up in Montreal good. earlier yeah, this year. Oh, that was so much fun. Yeah. Thank you for that. Bringing yeah. up that memory. Okay. What's coming up for Lou Dort? Playing on Team Canada. Speaking of Canada. Speaking yeah. of Canada, he's <laughs> going to be representing his country in Paris. And Lou just... I'm I'm really excited to see him in this environment. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen him in you know the FIBA World Cup and those sort of things. Um, but I'm excited for him to take his defensive talents to an international stage yeah. and see what that looks like. Um, you know, wreaking havoc on offensive players from all nations. I'm really curious. And, I mean, it's just going to be amazing to see if if Team Canada plays against the United States. Yeah, plays against uh, you know plays against Slovenia. It could be a, a you know matchup again. Of oh Lou wow! Dort and Luka Doncic. You know, just there's so many different possibilities that um, you get these NBA contexts and then you get these international contexts. And they're similar, but they're so drastically different right. uh, that it's really, you know, fun to just absorb all of that. And we all have we've we've talked about Shay. We've talked about these other guys who compete in these sort of environments. The diversity of the experience. Lou will probably have a little bit of a different role. I mean, really, just playing international basketball has a little bit of a different context. The rules are a little different. Yeah. You know, it's a different kind of basketball. Even like it's not even the same. You know, <laughs> ball that they use in the NBA. So it's like those sort of different things really help kind of beef up. Yeah. Uh, you know, a guy's skill set and you know their ability to handle all sorts of situations that are thrown their way. So really interesting to see what that's going to look like for Lou and what he's going to be working on throughout this off season heading into next year. It's going to be great. Yeah. Different rules, as we've always talked about, you know, the international game provides mm -hmm. just a different developmental context. Definitely. So be on the lookout for that. We'll keep you covered here on the Thunder Basketball Universe. And of course, go to at OKC Thunder on all social channels and OKCThunder.com for all of those updates throughout the summer. But that wraps up this episode. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Be sure to like, rate, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much to our producer, Matt Bishop. And until next time, Thunder Up and catch you later.